My name is Ruth Schaber, and on behalf of my family, we welcome you to the Free Library of Philadelphia and to the Sandra Schaber Memorial Lecture. This happens every year. <laughs> my mother had an insatiable curiosity about current events, history, and people. If she were here this evening, she would be sitting in the front row, taking notes, and she would be the first one with her hand up to ask the slightly provocative, but remarkably insightful and relevant question. I wish she were here tonight to meet my dear friend, colleague, and true rock star, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Nadine's the founder and CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco. She's been at the forefront of an issue of critical importance, the impact of early adversity on developing brains and bodies. Her TED talk on the topic, which has been viewed more than three million times, and I think maybe only one million by me, myself, but <laughs> is, is credited with bringing national attention to the prevention and treatment of childhood trauma. Her groundbreaking work has earned her the American Academy of Pediatrics Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism in Medicine Award and the Heinz Award, Award for the Human Condition. As a physician and public health expert myself, I believe that the impact of adversity on chronic disease is the most pressing public health crisis of our time. In her work, Nadine has done something truly magical. She has turned a public health crisis into action. Her new book, The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, draws on scientific evidence and powerful stories of individual impact to present a vital argument for how childhood stresses create lifelong neural system changes. Paul Tuff, author of How Ch Children Succeed, praises it, praises it as, quote, a heartbreaking, world-shaking, revolutionary book. Nadine offers a new set of tools based in science that can help each of us heal ourselves, our children, and our world. We're so pleased to have her here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Burke Harris. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you all for being here uh, to hear me share a little bit about um, my new book, The Deepest Well. Uh, healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity. I am so pleased, it could not be more auspicious, to be launching this book here tonight with you all. Um, uh, this started for me um, a little over a decade ago when I uh, finished my residency, my pediatrics residency at Stanford, and I wanted to work someplace where I was needed, someplace where I felt like I could really make a difference. And so I um, came to work for uh, a hospital in San Francisco called uh, California Pacific Medical Center, and together we opened a clinic in one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved uh, neighborhoods. And as I was seeing patients in this community, what I found was that I started to notice a disturbing trend. Over and over again, kids were being referred to me for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And so, you know, as, a, as this young uh, pediatrician in the community, I said, yes, absolutely, send them down. You know, I will, I will see them. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks were sending me these kids saying, please, you know, Dr. Burke, this was before I was married, you know, Dr. Burke, can you see Bobby, right? Bobby's falling out in class. He's hitting the kid next to him. He can't pay attention. Please, Dr. Burke, you got to put him on some Ritalin. And uh, so when I saw, um, you know, when I said, okay, I send them down and I'll, I'll, I'll see them, uh, what I found was that for many of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. And the reason is because, you know, at the t if you read the diagnostic criteria, 
right? At the time, it was something called the DSM-4, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, fourth edition. Um, when it gives you the definition of ADHD, there were all the symptoms that my patients had, right? Inattentive, poor impulse control, you know, all these uh, different things. But at the bottom, there was one line, and it said, and these symptoms are not caused by any other mental disorder, such as schizophrenia or something else. And I said, well, you know, I'm not a mental health specialist. I'm a, I'm a pediatrician. So what happens if the symptoms might be caused by another disorder, but it's not a mental disorder per se, right? Because even though we do such a great job of deciding that, you know, mental health is over here and the rest of the body is over here, the, the body doesn't make that distinction. So I asked myself the question, you know, what if there's something else going on that is the cause of these symptoms? And the reason that I asked that question was because when I actually sat down and, and, and did what I was trained to do, I did a thorough history and physical exam, uh, most of my kids, the history that I was hearing was that they had been exposed to terrible experiences of adversity. Like the, the twins that I took care of who witnessed an attempted homicide in their home, right? And then, lo and behold, they started having behavior problems and trouble with impulse control and getting into fights into school. And I had to ask myself, you know, what is the connection there? And, and when you see it in not one patient or two patients, but patient after patient after patient, for me, making that connection in that pattern was critically important to understanding what might be going on with my patients. And, and there was one other connection that happened there. Um, I will never forget, I had a patient who came in to see me for asthma, right? I'd been managing uh, this little girl, 10-year-old girl who had really severe asthma. And I had written her prescription for some really strong asthma medicines. And again, she came in with another uh, asthma exacerbation. And I was sitting down with her mom and I said, okay, I wanna go over this. Let, let's, let's take a step back and look at this one more time. You know, it, is there anything your child could be exposed to? We've looked at all these asthma triggers. Could it be pet dander or cockroaches or pollen? Like, when do you notice? Do you notice if there are any specific triggers for your child's asthma? And I will never forget what this mom said to me. She said, doctora, I notice that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. And so for me, I began to connect those dots. And connecting the dots for me was something that is, I guess, I don't know, part of my DNA. I had um, uh, a very fortunate experience. My dad is a biochemist, right? So uh, my dad has a, a PhD in organic chemistry. And, um, what that means is that um, when I was a kid, uh, I have four brothers. Uh, and when I was a kid, you know, my brothers and I, we would get into it like, you know, any house full of five children. And when, my, when we'd be in there, you know, throwing paper airplanes at each other and doing crazy stuff, you know, my dad was not like other dads. He was not the dad who would say, you better stop that before you poke your eye out. Um, what my dad uh, would say when he saw us throwing paper airplanes at each other was, oh my goodness, you're throwing paper airplanes. Well, if you calculate uh, time, you know, get out your stopwatch, and if you time the time where you release the airplane, and knowing that gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, right? 
and he turned it into a physics problem. And kind of thinking back on it now, this was genius parenting, right? Because what would happen is that my brothers would immediately put down the air paper airplanes and run in another direction. <laughs> um, but I loved it. I couldn't get enough. And whether it was throwing paper airplanes or at each other or, you know, a curry stain on my white blouse that turned from, you know, saffron yellow to, to purple when I touched it with a bar of soap, sitting there with my dad, everything was a science experiment. And what I learned from that is that there is a, a biological mechanism behind everything. And so when I found myself in Bayview Hunter's Point, seeing these patterns in the world, in the kids that I was seeing over and over again, rather than looking at these kids and asking, you know, what's wrong with you? My mind went immediately to the games I would play with my dad growing up. And I asked myself, you know, what is the biological mechanism that's behind this? And there was one patient in particular that really was the one who changed everything for me. I think I had had a lot of these ideas kind of bubbling around in the back of my mind. And um, for a long time, you know, the concept that there might be an actual biological link between what my patients were experiencing, what was going on in their environment and their health was just, you know, something that popped up in the back of my mind. It was kind of, you know, I wonder, is it possible? And then I will never forget a patient that I saw um, in 2007, a young boy who I talk about in the book uh, and I call him uh, Diego for the reasons of all the names are changed. Everything in the book is true, but the names are changed for patient privacy. Um, and I'll never forget the t first time that uh, Diego and his family came to see me. His mom brought him in. Uh, they were referred by um, the school for concerns of ADHD. And uh, when she came in to see me, she said, hey, you know, the school is telling me that my son needs medication. Can, can you tell me, is this true? Uh, you know, what do I need to do? And um, this little boy, so gorgeous, big brown eyes, big, you know, shaggy mop of black hair. And as he hopped up on the table and sat down, I uh, began doing my usual doctorly things that I do. I was, you know, looking at his medical chart and, and began uh, looking at him and started doing, you know, the history and I was doing my physical exam. And the thing that stood out for me was his growth chart. And when I looked at him, he looked small, like weirdly small, right? And I saw his birth date, and I was looking at the child, and I, I plotted it on the growth chart, and I had to double check myself, because I thought maybe I had make a, made a mistake. This child, although he was seven years old, he wasn't even on the chart, on the growth chart for a seven-year-old. His height was the mean, the average, for a four-year-old. And so, as I went through and I was doing my, uh, my physical exam, you know, I saw this kid, he's, he's, he's teeny tiny, looks like he's, he's not growing. Um, he also had, you know, uh, on top of the behavior problems, he also had, uh, you know, significant ex uh, asthma. When I listened to his lungs, I could hear the wheezing. And he had these, you know, funny skin rashes, some inflammation on his skin, looked like he had some eczema. And, um, and when I sat down and I uh, decided to get a little bit more history on these particular items, I asked his mom, um, you know, tell me about these behavioral issues. When did his behavioral problems start? And 
she lowered her head and she began to cry. And she said, Doctora, his behavioral problem started. We had a, a situation in our house. We had to take in a renter to help to offset the rent. Uh, and uh, he was someone we thought we knew, a colleague of my husband's uh, from work in construction. But one day we came home and we found him in the shower with Diego. And it was discovered that there had been this history of sexual assault since this renter had come into their home. And after that, uh, even though they called the police, and I don't mention it in the book, but this guy actually skipped town. Um, even though they called the police, after that, Diego had uh, began falling behind in school, started having more and more behavior problems, was really struggling. And the dad, uh, Diego's father, felt incredibly guilty and started drinking more and more. And there was a lot of stress in their household. So as a doctor, I, you know, I, I heard this awful story and my training told me, wow, that's a terrible trauma. Refer to social services, right? Or refer to mental health. And beyond that, you know, I have in front of me his asthma, his eczema, and I have this ADHD problem. And I know the treatment for asthma, you know, that's yeah, albuterol. I know the treatment for eczema, I can put some hydrocortisone on that. And I know the treatment for ADHD, right? That's uh, some Ritalin or a stimulant to help with um, underactive attention. Um, but something stopped me in my tracks. And it was maybe those games I'd been playing with my dad about this biological connection. And so I just thought to myself, there must be more going on here. It seems like there's a connection. And so I started reading everything I could get my hands on about how early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And, uh, and then one day, my colleague came into my office, right? Because uh, uh, it was my colleague that I had been working very closely with, Dr. Whitney Clark, who was a psychologist that worked in my office. And he walked in and he was smiling, because he knows me. <laughs> and he said, you know, have you seen this? And in, in his hand was a research paper. And uh, I, I said, could that possibly, like, wh what is that? Is, that? is that what I think it is? Because we had been talking about these connections between his work as a psychologist and the experiences uh, that our patients uh, were dealing with and my work as a pediatrician. And he had heard my hypothesis that somehow in there, this stress that kids were dealing with was somehow the underlying root cause. So when he showed me this paper, I will tell you what this, what this research study was. It was something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And that day changed my clinical practice and ultimately it changed my career. So this is a study that was done by the CDC and uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente, and um, what I will do, what I want to do is I want to take a moment to read to you uh, a little bit about what that moment of discovery was like for me and, um, and what, what it felt like for me that moment when I actually read uh, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Here it was the final piece of the puzzle that pulled all the others into place. Everything I had experienced in the past 10 years, all of these questions and observations I couldn't quite put together, suddenly had a linchpin. 
with my heart knocking in my chest, I read aloud the particularly mind-blowing parts of the study, occasionally stopping to whisper shout in Jamaican patois. <laughs> the first thing about this, the first, you know, little, any Jamaicans in the audience, a little rotted. <laughs> uh, the first thing about the study that struck me was uh, the first thing that struck me about Felidi and Anda's research was how incredibly robust it was. They reported data from 17,421 people. It was a large enough number to provide the validation I never thought I'd find. When I finished reading the study, my excitement didn't diminish. I felt like Neo at the end of the movie, The Matrix, when suddenly the world is dripping with green numbers. Not only was I seeing the full reality of what was all around me, but I understood it. According to the ACE study, I wasn't the only one making connections between the stress of childhood adversity and bad health outcomes. This piece of the puzzle, this final piece of code in the matrix, was just what I needed to make sense of what was going on with my patients, and more importantly, to treat them. At the time, I knew that this moment, this understanding, was going to profoundly change my practice, but I had no idea how much it would change my life. It was 1985 at the Kaiser Obesity Clinic in San Diego, and Dr. Vincent Felitti was interviewing his first patient of the day. If I were to stand behind Dr. Felitti, sorry, if you were to stand behind Dr. Felitti in line for soup in the hospital cafeteria or glide past him in the hallway, you would probably be struck by his bearing, stately, composed. These are the words that you might use. Every bit the poised intellectual with a, uh, with a full head of thick white hair he looked ready to host the news hour on public television or calmly moderate a debate between acrimonious politicians. He spoke with confidence and authority and was extremely articulate. Which is why, when he told me this story, I was blown away to discover that his biggest medical breakthrough had happened because of a verbal slip. Donna was a 53-year-old woman with debilitating diabetes and a significant weight problem. In a new weight loss program, she had successfully lost upwards of 100 pounds two years before. But in the past six months, she had put it all back on. Felitti felt a conflicting sense of frustration and responsibility. The truth was, he didn't really know why Donna had gone off the rails. She had been doing so well, and then after all her hard work and success, she was right back where she started. Felitti was determined to get to the bottom of it. He rattled off a list of his usual preliminary questions. How much did you weigh when you were born? How much did you weigh when you started the first grade? How much did you weigh when you entered high school? How old were you when you first became sexually active? But this time, he misspoke. Instead of asking how old were you when you first became sexually active, he asked, how much did you weigh when you first became sexually active? 40 pounds, said Donna. Her answer stopped him short. Wait a minute, 40 pounds? He was pretty sure he had heard her wrong, and for a minute, he didn't say anything. But then something made him ask the question again in the same way. Maybe she had meant 140 pounds. Sorry, Donna, how much did you weigh when you first became sexually active? She went quiet. He waited for her to speak, sensing that there was something there. Working with patients for over two decades had taught him that on the other side of a pregnant pause was usually diagnostic gold. 
I was 40 pounds, Donna said, looking down. Belitti waited, stunned. It was when I was four years old with my father. So after Felitti has the, a very similar experience with another patient of his, uh, he realizes that he's onto something. Felitti suspected that he might have glimpsed a hidden relationship between histories of abuse and obesity. To get a clearer picture of that potential relationship, when he conducted his normal checkups and patient interviews for the obesity program, he now began asking people if they had a history of childhood sexual abuse. To his shock, it seemed as if every other patient acknowledged such a history. At first he thought, there was no way this could be true. Wouldn't he have learned about this correlation in medical school? However, after 186 patients, he became convinced. But in order to make sure that there wasn't something idiosyncratic about his group of patients or about the way he asked the questions, he enlisted five colleagues to screen their next 100 weight patients for histories of abuse. When they turned up the same results, Validi knew he had uncovered something big. So that is the story of my experience of first learning about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study and also the experience of Dr. Vincent Felitti when he had a similar experience of, as mine of being a doctor, being a clinician, and learning from uh, one or two patients these histories of adversity and begin to connect that to their larger health problems. And what Dr. Vince Felitti did was he connected with a colleague at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and together, Kaiser Permanente and the CDC performed a study of more than 17,000 adults, and they asked them about their histories of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. These include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. And what they found in the study were two things that were incredibly striking. Number one, Adverse childhood experiences were incredibly common. Two thirds of their patient population had at least one adverse childhood experience. And one in eight individuals had four or more adverse childhood experiences. Now, Dr. Felitti did his research at Kaiser San Diego. This was not Bayview Hunters Point, the neighborhood that I serve. This was a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. And the second thing that they found in the study was that there was what they, they called a dose response relationship between these adverse childhood experiences and health problems. So the higher your adverse childhood experiences score, the worse your health problems. A person with four or more adverse childhood experiences has double the risk for heart disease, double the risk for cancer, two and a half times the risk of stroke, three times the risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, I just, want to just do a little kind of reality check here because when folks first understood this and learned the science, they didn't know how does this happen, right? They didn't know um, how is it that adversity in childhood leads to health problems in adulthood. And uh, when we're talking about increased risk of health problems or increased risk of heart disease, 
We're talking about for an individual who has high doses of adversity, has seven or more adverse childhood experiences, their risk of heart disease is like, you know, everyone knows like bacon is bad for your heart, right? Increases your risk of heart disease. Having seven or more adverse childhood experiences is like eating 33 strips of bacon a day, every day. That's how much, that's the difference in your risk of heart disease. Now, we all understand how bacon leads to heart disease, right? It's all of um, you know, this bad stuff. But what people didn't understand was how is it that early adversity leads to all of these different health problems? And the good news is that's where the last two decades of science has come together to fill in the gaps. And what we've learned is that it all comes down to this thing called our fight or flight response, right? It is the brain and body's response that is this normal and adaptive and actually healthy and life-saving part of our bodies. And it works a little something like this. So imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear, right? What happens in our brains and bodies, right? Immediately, your, your amygdala in your brain, this is a little part of your brain, it's the brain's alarm system, sounds the alarm. And it sends a message, your brain sends a message to your, your pituitary gland, that sends a message to your adrenal glands, which sits here right on top of our kidneys, and they release stress hormones, like adrenaline and cortisol. And so that is associated with all of the familiar feelings that we get when we're terrified. So, you know, our heart starts to pound, our pupils dilate, our airways open up. We shunt blood, right, to our big skeletal muscles so that we can run and jump and away from that teeny muscle that holds your bladder closed so you might pee your pants, right? Um, and that's awesome if you're in a forest and, and there's a bear because that primes your body to be able to fight that bear or run from the bear. That's our fight or flight system. Now, a couple of different things happen when you're getting ready to tango with a bear, which is one, if you were to think about it, fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? <laughs> and that's why you know, your amygdala alarm actually sends neurons, it sends projections to your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that is uh, responsible for, you know, uh, executive function, thinking, planning, impulse control, all that stuff, and turns it way, way, way down. Because now is not a good time for good judgment, right? Now you just want to be um, ready to fight this bear. And it, it turns down your free prefrontal cortex, and it turns up something called the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for I don't know karate, but I do know crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's responsible for getting you amped up, right? So imagine um, Eagles fans if your team wins the playoffs. <laughs> Right? And another thing that's a little bit less obvious is that when you activate your stress response, you also activate your immune response, right? Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you actually want your immune system to be primed, to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can live long enough to either fight the bear or run from the bear, right? And it's brilliant. The folks who did not evolve this system, they did not live to reproduce, right? But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to health damaging, right? And children are especially sensitive 
to the impacts of high doses of adversity because their brains and bodies are just developing. So high doses of adversity in children in actually affect the trajectory of the developing brain, the developing immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And for me, when I understood the science, the first thing that came to my mind is how the heck do I use this science to help my patients, right? Because although it sounds really scary and awful, it was actually, for me, incredibly hopeful. Because childhood adversity has been going on since God was a boy, right? It has, this is, but up until now, we didn't, no, how does it function? How does it change our trajectory? And when you know the mechanism, when you understand not only you know, what it does to the body, but how, then you can use that science for prevention and treatment. And that was, has been my mission uh, for the last 10 years. Is, uh, so I created the Center for Youth Wellness um, in San Francisco, and our focus has been preventing, screening, and healing the impacts of childhood adversity on children's developing brains and bodies. So this evidence has led us to look at what are the best ways to help children and families be able to recover from adversity and from this biological process of toxic stress. And I'm gonna tell you, there are a couple things that are absolutely critically important. One is raising awareness. When people understand what, what is actually going on, then families and communities can take steps to reduce the dose of adversity that children are exposed to. I can't tell you how often I hear, oh, you know, Yes, that happened when he was uh, little, but he didn't know about it. Uh, he was little, so it, it didn't affect him. Or he forgot about it, or he doesn't remember that, right? And what the science shows us is that's a myth, that when children, and especially little ones, are exposed to high doses of adversity, that it actually can be more impactful on their development. So now we begin to debunk some of these myths with a little bit of truth telling and a little bit of science, right? So we need to shout it from the rooftop so everybody knows, so communities know what they can do to take care of themselves and each other. The next piece is all of the science shows us that when we do early intervention, kids, have, kids can do much, much better. We can see much better outcomes. And by the way, the intervention doesn't have to be as expensive, and oftentimes it does not have to be as uh, intensive. But we're much more likely to get successful outcomes when we begin earlier. As a doctor, this is fundamental. Treating stage four cancer is a heck of a lot harder than treating stage one cancer. So what do we do? We screen for cancer. We need to be screening every child for adverse childhood experiences as part of their routine physical exam. And then we have to use the science to help families understand how to deal with an overactive stress response. I'll tell you, when I tell my teenagers, because of what you've experienced, your body may actually be making more stress hormones than the average person. And that could look and feel like being quick to anger, having trouble controlling your impulses, or getting sick easily when you feel overwhelmed. I will tell you the number one thing that my, my teenage, teenagers say to me is, you mean that I'm not crazy? To understand that is their biology, and in fact, that is their body's way of trying to protect them. It is our most ancient protective mechanisms that are in play, but because of what they've experienced, their biology is now overactive. And we can use this science to help us understand how do we do, how do, we do things that help to reduce the activity of the stress response. Things like meditation 
things like regular exercise, right? High quality nutrition. And one of the things that science now shows us about toxic stress is that the definition of toxic stress is this activation of the stress response in absence of the buffering effect of a stable caregiver, right? So that means that what we do as caregivers is critically important to preventing the long-term biological consequences. But guess what? As a mom of four kids, I can tell you that I cannot help my child manage his stress response if I myself do not have a healthy and well-regulated stress response. So self-care is not selfish, right? We actually have to do many of the same things that I talk about in the book that are effective for children are also effective for us as caregivers. So we need to take that mindfulness moment. We need to go to, for that walk. We need to call that girlfriend and get a little bit of buffering or make an appointment with our therapist, right? And the last thing that we have to do is change the way our society responds to this issue. Every single sector of our society, from doctors to educators to parents to policymakers to police officers to judges, <laughs> needs to understand this issue. And that means that we have to raise our voices and be advocates, because the only way that we will change these systems is to generate the public will. In conclusion, I'm going to wrap up. If there's anything that this book is about, is that this science is about the hopeful power to change. The die is not cast. And we know that what is so exciting for all of us who are touching the lives of children is that every single one of us, parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, doctors, educators, counselors, every single one of us can be part of this change. And if y'all will indulge me, I'm going to wrap up by reading one little part at the end here. I might go like a minute over, but. Um, <laughs> I believe that we are standing on the cusp of a new revolution, and it is every bit as consequential as the one sparked by Pasteur's discovery of germs. What's exciting is that the movement has already begun. The work of Jeanette Pai Espinosa and Dr. Pam Cantor in New York that are, that are doing in communities and schools is part of the ACEs public health response. The work that Nancy Mannix and the Center for Youth Wellness are doing is part of the medical response. But right now, we're just at the hand washing stage. We have yet to develop fourth generation antibiotics in the treatment of toxic stress. But we can use the knowledge of how the stress response triggers health problems to institute some basic hygiene, screening, trauma-informed care and treatment, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. These are the equivalent of Lister dipping his instruments in carbolic acid to sterilize them and requiring his surgical students to wash their hands. When we understand that the source of so many of our society's problems is exposure to childhood adversity, the solutions are as simple as reducing the dose of adversity for kids and enhancing the ability of caregivers to be buffers. From there, we keep working our way up, translating that understanding into the creation of things like more effective educational curricula and the development of blood tests that will identify biomarkers for toxic stress. Things that will lead to a wide range of solutions and innovations, reducing harm bit by bit and then leap by leap. The cause of the harm, whether it's microbes, or childhood adversity does not need to be totally eradicated. The revolution is in the creative application of knowledge to mitigate harm wherever it pops up. Because when you know the mechanism, 
you can use that understanding in countless ways to drastically improve the human condition. And that is how you spark a revolution. You shift the frame, you change the lens, and all at once, the world is revealed, and nothing is the same. Thank you. So how much of long-standing childhood adversity do you think contributes to racial inequality, social injustice, et cetera? Um, a tremendous amount. I think uh, most of us in this room can have a sense of um, what we think is contributing. I talk um, a little bit uh, in the book about uh, one piece, which is that I think a lot of us, one of the things that we know is that um, adversity, and particularly the, the historic traumas that have been perpetrated in our country, have lasting impacts on our biology, right? Uh, and that is really profound. But I think one of the pieces that is important about this science is that what we're talking about is just our basic biology, and the mechanism is the same in all peoples. And so I think we have an incredible opportunity to come together as a society and say, you know, so many different sectors feel like, you know, childhood adversity is our problem, right? And what we recognize is that this happens in all communities, among all socioeconomic, racial, and uh, groups, and the solution that lifts any one of us up, hopefully can lift up the entire community. And I think that's an opportunity for us to invest in solutions to lift up all children. Have you come across or been involved in any research um, about how mitigating um, those high ACE score children really helps? I heard you talk about meditation, mindfulness, nutrition, exercise, mm -hmm. but is there research on it? Yes, and it's in the book. Um, yes, there's, there's actually, um, so, and, and this is, this is the piece. So as uh, my team at the Center for Youth Wellness reviewed uh, a little over 16,000 research articles about uh, the impact of adversity and uh, different solutions, uh, different interventions. And what we see is that things like mindfulness are associated with a reduction in stress hormones, a reduction in inflammation, a reduction in the uh, biological effects of toxic stress. Um, we also found that nurturant caregiving, oh, this is the, read the book. <laughs> Nurturant caregiving um, is associated with um, positive changes in the structure and function of the brain that we just are in publication right now on a study that is measurable by MRI uh, with Early, in early detection and early institution of nurturant caregiving, and it literally can change the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So just as uh, harmful environments can harm our bodies, healing environments, safe, stable, and nurturing environments and relationships can literally heal us from the inside out. And I've, yes. I've adopted several children who were older. One was seven, one was six, um, and then they're, I want to know, I mean, they seem to be, okay, who knows? I mean, the, the returns are not completely in yet. But I loved what you said about the strength of adversity, that sometimes when one of them was a street child in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I want to know how, how they get over that. I mean, how often they revisit it. I think they had a soft landing and would been a very large family, and I think they're okay. But, you know, we haven't produced any felons yet. Yeah, but uh, but I want to know how much that strength means and how important it is to be in a setting that's kind and loving and if it ever goes away. Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing I'll say is, as an adoptive parent, congratulations on being an adoptive parent. It's a really special experience, um, and I'm I'm so glad that you're here because. Um, the, the way that our experiences and our, you know, our nature and nurture interact to shape who we are going to be uh, and, and, and how we are affected 
is, is really, really variable, right? But there's one thing that we do know about childhood adversity, which is that if you take 100 kids and you expose them all to, you know, four adverse childhood experiences or some significant amount of adversity, right, not all of them will have an awful outcome. Um, but the moral of that story is not how is it that the kids who don't have an awful outcome do okay. We need to do research into that and to understanding. But for me, the moral of the story is don't take 100 kids and expose them to <laughs> adversity, right? Um, and you know, it's so funny, I, I, with you being here, there's one other thing that I wanted to say, so I'm so happy you're here. One of the really important things about this science, um, particularly for the adoptive uh, parents who called into the station this morning, is that it helps us in order to be able to think about interventions for our kids. But as an adoptive parent, this science has been life-saving to me as a parent. There are some days where I just need to say, you know, look at my kid and say, oh, you know what, because of their, what they've experienced, their body may be making a few more stress hormones than would be average, and this is their, their body's biological response, right? And so they're not in my face because they're trying to mess with me, right? They're not, they're not being, you know, whatever. And understanding that context, I think, is really also important just for helping us as parents maintain our sanity. Um, with, with the issue of child abuse, um, uh, kids are sort of wired not to disclose um, that they want to pr protect their parents. They've been trained to keep secrets. So, so my, my question is, um, how do you, um, uh, you know, in, in increase that disclosure? Um, there are a couple of different ways. Um, number one, when we do routine screening in our Center for Adverse Childhood Experiences, one of the things that we do, um, because it's actually the parent who's disclosing if the child is zero to 12, right? If the child is zero to 12, we're asking the parent. And if they're 13 and older, we ask the parent and the child in separate forms. And one of the things that we do is something called a de-identified screen. And it's actually at the back of the book. And we ask our uh, families to say not which ones of the adverse childhood experiences their child has experienced, only how many. And what that allows us to do, because if I'm a doctor and I have 10 kids on my schedule for the afternoon, it is critically important that I screen all of them for adverse childhood experiences because it is a major health threat. But unpacking the individual stories of every single one of those 10 kids is, is, is very, very difficult to do in the context of the standard medical uh, visit. And so recognizing that I can, I can understand, I can see from parents, and we actually, in our anecdotal pra practice, and we need to get more research on this, we see a higher disclosure rate. Parents are more willing to say, instead of, yes, my child experienced physical abuse, and yes, there's a substance-dependent person or someone in our home who is incarcerated, what they write on the form is a three, right? And then what we're able to do in our center is connect that family to an additional resource that can then go through and unpack that, and they have a lot more time. And so that's one of the ways that we increase disclosure. Are, are there any um, school districts that are trying to um, use your methods or use any kind of type of system to help the children within their school district? Yes, there are many. Uh, there are many. Um, and. Um, I, I talk a little bit about what folks have been uh, doing a, at Turnaround for Children in New York, uh, which is an organization that has worked with school districts in uh, New York, DC, uh, and a couple other cities. I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. But I'm really, I'm so glad you asked that question because here in Philadelphia, there are two really important groups that are doing this work. There are more than that, but there's two off the top of my head. Um, the Philadelphia ACE Task Force and, <laughs> and uh, Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities. Uh, the MARC program, and these are multidisciplinary cross-sector initiatives that are addressing adverse childhood experiences right here in Philadelphia. Uh, two things. Um, Dr. Wade, 
his five urban questions. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with those? I sure I, am. Thanks. And I just wanted to know, I'm not really clear. Is he basing this geographically or is he basing it racially and economically? And the other question is, I am in a Philadelphian, have been a nurse in the Philadelphia public health system. I read about Swartz and Bloom's book, and I'm a patient in that system. And I wanted to know, how can we get this implemented? I asked my physician in the health center, has she ever done an ACE or seen an ACE? And she said, no. And we have two initiatives here in Philadelphia. How can we bring them together to come into our public health center and get the ACEs implemented? So that uh, is a wonderful question. Uh, the 11th Street Clinic uh, here in Philadelphia <laughs> has incorporated this work on uh, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress in their work. They are actually a leader in this work nationally. And um, you know we are learning from each other about how to do this work. Uh, in addition, uh, for those in the pediatric practice, and I know you may be talking about adult medicine, but in, in pediatrics, uh, our center has created a, a national learning community. It's called the National Pediatric Practice Community on ACE Screening. And it is a virtual community. Any practitioner who's in primary care can sign up and be part of our uh, national practice community. And then we also have pilot sites where a team from our center will come out, look at your electronic medical record, and help you be uh, look at how you're training your staff and help to integrate the adverse childhood experiences screening process into your uh, medical, routine medical visits. But absolutely what you said, we have to be advocates. We have to, re we have to ask our doctors, and if our doctors don't know about it, ask them if they would be willing to learn. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. Thank you.